Greetings, and once again, welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel, and today I'll be discussing the last of the propositions that I needed to cover in Book 1 of Euclid's Elements. So let's begin. Now, you will have remembered that uh, Proposition 35 is about parallelograms having the same area on the same base. But now remember that at this stage Euclid hadn't even defined numbers, hadn't even defined area excepting uh, as a plane number much later. Uh, and so, and so uh, the ancient Greeks didn't even really have a proper definition of arithmetic mean from which we know that calculus, uh, the, the, the methods that apply to calculus work, simply because if you, did, if you weren't able to get the arithmetic mean of all the y-ordinates in a given interval of a smooth function, then you would not be able to calculate areas or volumes or anything like that. So the mean value theorem itself is about an arithmetic mean. And I was the first to reveal that. It's unremarkable that there is a C in the interval such that uh, F prime of C is equal to the endpoints of that interval divided by the interval length. So now in the Euclidean proof, uh, Euclid goes about showing that the areas in the parallel parallelograms are equal by breaking them breaking them down into congruent triangles so for example um, you'll see that this triangle here a b e or the green one that you see down here and the triangle d c f the red one that you see here are congruent and it doesn't matter how you move this um, always if we remove this part let's just do this if we remove this part here this part here and this part then this area is equal to this area okay so it doesn't matter how far you stretch that out so you see if we remove this check this uh, hatched area this green area is equal to the red area. And of course, here I'm showing you the total area of the triangles. They're exactly the same. So if you remove the same part, then the remaining areas are still the same. Okay, And that's basically the gist of Euclid's proof. But of course, this is also easily seen even without the long-winded approach of Euclid. And I'm very much one who advocates revision of the elements because the elements are the foundations of mathematics. And of course, Euclid did not state how he got the five requirements, but I have done that for you. I, I have shown you and I will provide a link that you can systematically derive the five requirements which are not axioms of any kind from nothing. Okay, so now how do we get this uh, same thing from the requirements? Well. If we had to draw a circle like this, okay, then we could make each of these triangles, the base, equal to this length here, right? And of course, we could put a circle around these two endpoints as so, like so. So we could put a circle there, right? And of course, if we stretched out the green angle so that it meets on a similar arc, then again, once again, the green angle, the green, the green triangle, and the red triangle will also have the same area. Okay, so same thing happens here. If we had to have another circle around there and we stretched out these red lines, this area would still be equal to this green area if this circle were mo were moved to this side. The same circle were moved to this side. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about in Proposition 35. It's a very important proposition. The rest of the propositions uh, are not really remarkable except for the Pythagorean theorem in which this proposition is used. And so, of course, 
uh, Euclid goes on to show later on that a triangle is half the area of the parallelogram they're addressed on. But that's pretty silly because in any given parallelogram, we know that there are two triangles which are exactly congruent. So that pretty much does it with my series on Euclid's Elements, book one. And I'm, I've completed all those propositions, left out a few that are, I, I think are not relevant and are actually covered in the requirements. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I know that the previous videos have been a bit tough because they've been covering my historic geometric theorem in which I show you that you can derive both the derivative and the integral, the definite integral definition from nothing without using any ill-formed concepts such as infinity, infinitesimals, or the circular rot of limit theory. So I'll place everything in the link in the details section, all the links and everything else, and you can study it and uh, learn more from there. So I'm going to stop here. This is a new calculus channel. I'm John Gabriel. Till next time, goodbye.